This episode was brought to you by the Disney Collect app. What is going on, my fellow mythology nerds? My name is John Solo, and in case you haven't figured this out by now, I really love the movie Hercules. No, not that stinky pile of wet, moldy gutter trash. I'm talking Disney's Hercules, which yes, also puts its own creative spin on the ancient Greek myths, but unlike that blasphemous travesty, it doesn't make me want to put my head through a plate glass window whenever I watch it. Maybe that's because of the beautiful animation style, maybe it's the music, because after all, it does feature my favorite Disney song of all time, or maybe it's Megara. I mean, damn. Look at her. It's no secret that I love comparing this masterpiece to the original myths that inspired it. So far we've compared and contrasted the various versions of Hercules, Hades, Hermes, Aphrodite, Hera, Philatetes, and more. But I'm ashamed to admit that, like Hercules, I've given Meg the shaft, only in a much less fun way than he did. I say that because we haven't really talked about her that much since my first video on the Greek hero from over two years ago, and just like the Disney character, she is a vital part of Hercules' adventures. If it weren't for her, he may never have gone on those 12 labors, gained the fame that made him a legendary hero or been granted immortality. Not to mention that no matter what timeline you're looking at, she went through an immeasurable amount of suffering because of Hercules. If you don't know her story yet, you're about to be both appalled and amazed. But first, I want to say thank you to this week's sponsor, the Disney Collect app. I have three questions for you. Do you like Disney? Do you like collecting things? And do you like staring into the infinite electronic abyss that is your cell phone? If you answered yes to any or all of these questions, then I have the app for you. The Disney Collect app gives you the ability to collect virtual trading cards with your favorite Disney characters on them. Whether it's the OG cartoons, your favorites from childhood, or their newer films, they've got characters from essentially any property you can think of. It's super easy to build your collection too. There's new missions for you to complete every day, and an arcade where you can earn bonus cards through making wishes. Then you can use the cards you collect to complete sets, craft them into rare cards, or even use them to trade with Disney fans around the world world like me. And what's really dope is that we are partnering with Disney Collect to bring you a brand new Hercules set. But these aren't just your average cards. There's the Sinister Shadows Tilt variant featuring your favorite underworld residents, pottery die cuts, a very appropriate choice for Greco mythological characters, and my personal favorite, the Sketches Motion cards, where you can watch the illustrations take shape before your very eyes. This set was made exclusively because we knew the Solo fan would love them, so make sure you check them out. All you've got to do is follow my download link in the description, then find the Hercules Collect in the central store. Then, when you've got yourself established, make sure to add me by searching Real John Solo and we can do some trading. Okay, let's dive into some mythological madness, shall we? Sit back, relax, hit that like button, and subscribe for more mythology content in your sub box on a regular basis, and most importantly, enjoy. Now, for those who have forgotten her role in the movie, Megara is the pretty young thing that Hercules pines after. Little does he know, she actually is stuck working for Hades because she'd previously sold her soul to him to save the man she was in love with, who ultimately abandoned her. Hercules eventually finds out the truth and is heartbroken, but Meg sacrifices herself to save our hero, and Hercules returns the favor by saving her soul from Hades. These heroic acts result in Hercules being granted God status, but he turns it down in favor of staying with Meg on Earth, and the two live happily ever after. It's a beautiful story, and one of my favorites that Disney has ever told. But the myth it was inspired by is far more tragic than that, so let's talk about why. Now, interestingly, despite Meg not being a Disney princess, which in my opinion is an unforgivable sin, she was actually the daughter of the king regent of Thebes named Creon. If you don't remember, Thebes is actually the city where Meg lures Hercules into fighting the Hydra, so there's a funny little connection right there. The reason her lineage is significant is because that's actually how she meets Hercules, who, by the way, I'm going to call Heracles from this point forward because that was his actual Greek name. You see, when Heracles arrived in Thebes during his travels, he discovered they were being forced to pay tribute of 100 cattle every year to Urgen, the king of the Minions, who inhabited the city of Orchomenus. Now, you may not think that's too hefty of a tribute, but what's really messed up about it is that the Minions stripped the Thebans of all their weapons in order to keep them subordinate and make sure they never rebelled, so Thebes was helpless against its oppressors. Heracles, who was a good guy at heart, wasn't going to stand for the Thebans being treated so unfairly, so guess what he did? When the Minion emissary showed up to collect their tribute, 
tribute, he cut off their tongues, hands, and ears, tied them in bundles around their necks, and told them to give those to their king as tribute. I know, I was surprised they didn't put that in the movie too. As you would expect, King Creon was terrified of what Urgenus's response would be, but Heracles told him to relax and let him handle it. First, he took all of the weapons and armor that were on display in their sacred temples and gave them to the Thebans. What I found really funny about this is that some experts cited him doing this as proof that Bronze Age customs were not upheld in the Hero Age. But others have pointed out that Heracles' behavior should never be looked at as an appropriate example of social customs. In other words, my guy may not have been perceived as the most cordial, but he also wasn't going to let a bunch of religious prudes get in the way of him saving lives. Now, the enraged Urgenus declares war on Thebes and joins his armies in marching towards the city, but Heracles has the brilliant plan of cutting them off in a narrow valley where their greater numbers are rendered useless. This strategy should sound familiar to anyone who's seen 300 because the Spartans use it against the Persians. Well, Heracles' plan proves to be a success and Urgenus himself is actually killed in battle, but that still wasn't enough guarantee for our hero that Thebes would be left alone. So, he sneaks into the Minion territory and burns the majority of it to the ground. The surviving Minions agreed to pay Thebes back double for all their tributes over the years, and Heracles agrees to let them live. To show his gratitude, King Creon promises Heracles the hand of his beautiful daughter Megara in marriage, and the hand of his younger, also beautiful daughter to Heracles' twin brother, Iphicles. Yeah, Heracles has a twin brother. It's like finding out there's a fourth Jonas brother, Frank. Anyway, Heracles and Megara get married, and they live happily ever after. Just kidding. So after Heracles and Meg tie the knot, they get real, real busy and pop out a couple kids. The actual number and their names vary depending on the author, big surprise, but is usually said to be two, three, or eight. Three is the most common figure thrown out there, but Theban tradition has always maintained eight, and that's where Meg lived, so I'm personally leaning towards that. There's also an interesting theory that says the reason authors like Euripides may have reduced it was to make writing and casting his plays easier. Weird how many random factors influence and shape these famous stories. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, and you already know what's coming if you've seen my other videos on Heracles, their relationship takes a hard left turn for the worse when Hera, Zeus's wife, who is not a fan of her husband's bastard child, curses Heracles with a fit of madness. Once again, there's a few different ways that his meltdown unfolds, and I'm going to break down each of them. In one version, Heracles' cousin, King Eurystheus, who actually sits on the throne that Zeus had reserved for Heracles before Hera forced his cousin to be born two months early, learns of Heracles' growing power, either through word of mouth or Hera, and summons him to complete ten dangerous labors. Understandably, Heracles says, bump that. He's the son of a god and has already accomplished so much, why should he run errands for some king? That being said, he is still legally obligated to follow his orders, so for guidance, he meets with the Oracle of Delphi to learn what the gods want him to do. In some versions, the Olympians all agree that he should do the labors, and in return, he'll be granted immortality, but in some versions, the Oracle is on Hera's payroll and only tells him that because it'll increase the chances that he'll die painfully. When he gets home, he prays to the gods to send them his own message, but while he's metaphysically exposing himself, Hera takes this opportunity to curse him with madness. This causes him to try and kill his nephew, Ioleus, who escapes, and his two children, who don't escape. How does he kill them, you ask? Excellent question, you curious little weirdo. He either tosses his kids over the city walls, throws them into a fire, or shoots them with his bow and arrows. When he finally returns to his senses, he's so torn up by what he's done that he considers killing himself, but instead he atones for his sins by agreeing to complete the labors. In a different version, Heracles is praying to the gods, gets struck with madness, kills his kids, and then goes to the Oracle of Delphi to see how he can ask for forgiveness. And that is when she tells him to complete the labors. Again, because Hera's slipping her some deep dollars under the table. Both of these have endings where Megara is killed alongside her children and where she survives. She gets super killed in this next one though, like hardcore mega killed. And we have the Roman playwright Seneca the Younger to thank for the appetite inducing imagery that accompanies her death. See in this version the massacre doesn't happen until Heracles has already completed 11 of his 12 labors. While he's away in the underworld completing the final one, capturing Cerberus, Megara's brothers and her father King Creon are assassinated by the formerly exiled warrior Lycus who takes over the throne. Lycus also tries coming on to Meg and making her his queen, but she isn't having any of it. There's an exchange I love in this play where there's some clever banter between the two of them, and that actually reminds me of the Meg from the movie. Lycus asks her if there's any better present he could give her as the new king than allowing her to be his queen, and she replies, if you died or I died, that'd be better. Well, Lycus doesn't take too kindly to rejection, so he tosses Megara and her children into the street with no food or clothing. Meanwhile, Heracles gets back from his labors and finds out about this from his mortal father and 
Amphitryon and proceeds to run over to Thebes and slaughter Lycus. Afterward, he prays to the gods, thanking them for allowing him to return home both swiftly and safely, and this is when Hera strikes him with madness, causing him to believe that Megara is her and his own children are Lycus's children. And what follows is a pretty savage description of their slaughter. He grabs one son by the arm and smashes him on the ground head first. He shoots his baby with a poison-tipped arrow, although it had already died out of fright, and he obliterates Megara's skull with his club. As the horrified Amphitryon kneels before him, begging him to kill him too, the mad warrior's eyes roll up in his head and he passes out. When he wakes up a few hours later, he looks around the room and realizes what he's done and almost immediately tries to kill himself with the same poison arrow he shot his son with. Only Amphitryon convinces him not to by pointing out that the only reason he did such horrible deeds was because Hera cursed him and wanted his hopeless suicide to be the end result. And even though Heracles argues that he deserves to be punished for his sins, curse or not, he relinquishes and agrees to atone. If you're wondering how he's supposed to atone when he's already completed his 12 labors, you're out of luck because that's when the play ends. Now I've got one last version that I really want you to hear. It was written by Euripides and is very similar to Seneca's. Once again, while Heracles is off completing his labors, Lycus usurps the throne, only Euripides clarifies this is actually the son of the Lycus who was exiled. So by killing Creon, he was avenging his father. When the hero gets back, he kills Lycus, but again, he's struck with madness while praying. He shoots one son with an arrow, smashes the other one with a club and then tears apart the door that Megara and his infant son are hiding behind with his bare hands and then kills them both by striking them with a piece of the wood. Then, just when he's about to kill Amphitryon, the warrior goddess Athena appears and smashes Heracles into a wall by throwing a boulder into his chest and he's knocked unconscious. Naturally, Heracles is devastated and, like the other versions, wants to kill himself, but instead, Theseus convinces him to journey with him back to Athens where he'll be purified of his sins. For those who are a little confused, when Heracles was in the underworld, he rescued Theseus, therefore he felt compelled to repay his debt. So those are the many versions of Heracles' rage. And believe it or not, there's even more than that. But at that point, the differences are so nuanced that I don't think it's really necessary for us to cover them. As it pertains to Meg, though, she had one of two fates. She was either spared or brutally murdered. Regardless of the one you prefer, we do know what happens to her afterward, and that's what we're talking about next. So let's start with what happens to Meg after she dies, because that story is short and sweet. Well, maybe not sweet, but you know what I mean. Apparently during King Odysseus' journeys, he saw Meg in the underworld. He doesn't really have much to say about her, but he does confirm that's where she ended up with the line, and Megara I saw, daughter of Creon, high of heart, whom the son of Amphitryon, ever stubborn in might, had to wife. Now in the timeline where Megara lives, Heracles doesn't even stay with her, despite her waiting around for him to return and worrying that he may not even survive. There's actually a poem called Megara by an anonymous Greek author that details a conversation she has with her mother-in-law Alcmene where she talks about how scared she is for his life. There's nothing else of significance in the poem, but it's an interesting read. If you want to check it out, there's a link in my sources section. Now, as we all know, Heracles did survive his labor. So what do he do with Megara once he got back? Well, there's some timelines where he kills her, as I mentioned earlier, and there's others where he gives her to his cousin Iolaus, who actually helped him complete his labors. Those two went on to dent the headboard and in the process had a daughter whose name I bet you can't even pronounce. Leopipheline? Leopipheline? Leopipheline. There's no way that's right. The weird thing about that, though, is that Meg's daughter went on to marry a guy named Felis, Heracles' grandson. Just imagine how it would feel if your child started dating and got married to your ex's grandchild. Even if they were in the same age group, that would creep me the fuck out. Anyway, while Meg was busy with Iolaus, Heracles moved on to Princess Ioli. He won the right to marry the princess by beating her father and brother in an archery contest, but they refused to give the winner his prize out of fear that he would slaughter her and their children like he did before. I know, right? Come on guys, it was a one-time thing except for the fact that it wasn't. See, after the archery contest, some cattle get stolen and Heracles gets blamed. But Iphidus, the only one of Ioli's brothers who said that Heracles should be allowed to marry her, stood by his new friend's innocence. He invited the hero to help him find the cattle and he agreed, but again, Hera cursed Heracles with madness and he threw Iphidus over the city walls. And that kills him in case that wasn't clear. With no other choice but to leave their city, Heracles goes to Caledon, where he meets Princess Deianira and marries her, and therefore obtains a kingdom and army for himself. After growing so much in status, Heracles then waged war on Ochalia as revenge for them denying his prize. He killed the king and his sons, and then he abducted Ioli, who wasn't a fan of Heracles at this point. Now, remember the scene in the movie where Hercules meets Meg? She's in the process of being abducted by the centaur Nessus, who wanted her as payment for him joining Hades' team. Well, that scene was inspired by Hercules 
Hercules' wife, Deonyra. Here's how. As you might expect, Deonyra wasn't exactly thrilled that Heracles used the power he received when they got married to abduct the much younger, prettier woman he tried marrying before her and make her his guma. So his wife wanted to ensure that his heart would be hers forever. You see, years earlier, the centaur Nessus offered to carry Deonyra across the river. Only when he got to the other side, he tried raping her. Heracles wasn't going to let that happen though. So from across the river, he shot Nessus through the chest with an arrow poisoned with Hydra's blood, killing him. Only before the centaur died, he told Deonyra that his blood could be used as a love potion and that if she gave it to Heracles, he would never leave her. Now fast forward back to the present day. While Heracles is preparing a feast to celebrate the capture of Aeoli and the conquering of her kingdom, he tells his wife to fetch his nicest tunic. Deonyra happily obliged, only before giving him the tunic, she secretly spread the centaur's blood all over it, not realizing that it mixed with the hydra's blood and was now highly toxic. The moment that Heracles put on the tunic, the poison entered his body Body, burning away his skin and exposing his bones. Knowing that there was only one way for the now immortal Heracles to escape this torture, he climbed Mount Etna, uprooted some trees, and built his own funeral pyre, which was lit by Philatetes. The fire proceeds to burn away the hero's mortal form so that only his immortal, godly soul is left, and Heracles is finally able to live on Mount Olympus, where he meets and marries Hebe, his half-sister. In my original video on Heracles, I misspoke and said he married Athena, and I will never forgive myself. 12 lashings for the mythology novice, Thank you. Anyway, Solo fam, those were the messed up origins of Megara and the story Disney wrote for her. Got any thoughts? I feel like this was a weird one because as important of a character as Meg is in Heracles' story, she really didn't do all that much. Rather, things happened to her. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, there are plenty of characters like that in mythology, but I think this is the first time we've ever looked at one this in depth. Every other character has had an adventure of their own. I digress, but I do really want to hear your impressions of Megara's story and what version you like best. Make sure to comment your thoughts down below and then hit those like and subscribe buttons to support the channel and get notified whenever I upload. I've also been getting a lot of comments from people telling me that they haven't been receiving their notifications despite having that bell rung, so whether that applies to you or not, it might be a good idea to turn them off and turn them back on again. Again. Also, don't forget to follow me on social media, which I'm slowly converting into a place where you can receive more messed up content. In addition to bite-sized clips, I'm also going to start sharing the random fun facts I learned in my research. Fun facts is in quotes because some of them are just terrifying. I'll see you all next week with the second official episode of Nursery Rhymes Explained, where we're talking about the origins of London Bridge. Until that day comes, though, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.